eight o'clock and uh, welcome to uh, yet another episode of uh, Marvelous Medicine. Uh, Dr. Vijay will be speaking to us for the third time, and today it's on secondary scientific health interventions and stress reduction. Uh, to moderate the session, we have Dr. Meena Chauhan. She's a freelance anesthesiologist at uh, Roorkee, Uttarakhand. She did her MBBS from Kasturba Medical College, Manipal, and her DNB anesthesia from Dinanath Mangeshkar Hospital, Pune. She's a proud army wife moving from city to city and adapting successfully in both her personal and professional life. She has presented uh, several papers in many conferences and has received the General Proficiency Award from the Indian Society of Anesthesiologists in 2019. Pandemic, she has done mind programming and psychological first aid courses and has been helping family, friends and colleagues to cope with during stressful times. We started a public awareness page on Facebook and uh, we have uh, weekly talks aimed at the public. Uh, at, at the moment, it's being done in Hindi, but uh, in future, we'll be doing in other languages as well. She's a cheerful, vivacious person and the life and soul of parties and a wonderful singer. Maybe if we have some time in the end, uh, we'll request uh, Meenal to sing a song for us. Joining us as a special guest is uh, Ramya Satish, who's a consultant psychologist at Synapse Pain and Spine Clinic and for the Shankara Educational Institutions. She's also a visiting consultant at Hamsa Rehab Center. Her educational qualifications are a bachelor's in technology, master's in social work and psychology, diplomas in transactional analysis, behavior therapy, and therapeutic yoga. Her focus areas are pain and stress management, personal relationships, social anxiety management, depression and compulsions, and she incorporates yoga in her therapy plan. She's involved in several social products and volunteers her time for several causes. Welcome, Meenal and Ramya. Dr. Vijay Bose does not uh, need any introduction, so I thought I would just ask him a few questions. Uh, Dr. Bose, what made you change tracks, as it were, from operative orthopedics to uh, health and fitness? <laughs> no, no, I have not given up orthopedics at all. Uh, no, I think, you know, um, as I've been stressing in many of the, the talks, earlier talks, that it's very important for all of us. And uh, we as doctors are very bad at lifestyle interventions. We're very good at disease interventions in our own specialties. We're extremely good at that. But when it comes to lifestyle intervention, we are not taught in medical school. If you look at, you know, for example, somebody with an, uh, who needs a lifestyle intervention, orthopedic, somebody says, you know, how to look after your knee. I mean, I'm not qualified. To, I mean, at least I was not qualified to give the answer because you are not taught in medical school and any of the uh, courses that I have done. So this is something that has uh, come up uh, of late, which I thought was very, very interesting. And it's as important as disease intervention is to, uh, you know, for health intervention, to be healthy, not get disease. So prevention is the best, uh, you know, better than cure. So that's what kindled my interest. And that's what I have tried to uh, pass it on to others. So that's the, it, Dr. Vidya. Was it something you were always interested in or uh, uh, and didn't have time to do or uh, something that uh, some interest that you developed recently? No, I, I always love observing patients, you know, various things, not just the treatment part of it and all that. So it's very fascinating that, you know, that we as specialists, um, for example, if you take orthopedic surgery, there are a lot of orthopedic surgeons who are obese, who have knee osteoarthritis. A lot of patients who are 70 years old without knee osteoarthritis, this is lifestyle disease. So who is the expert here? Is it the orthopedic surgeon or the patient? Yeah. So I knew that we need to have a sort of a reorientation of what we, we think in allopathy, you know, as dictum and disease intervention. It doesn't apply to lifestyle at all. And, uh, you know, whenever I see a patient who is, you know, who is doing well, who is got, who doesn't have arthritis, he's 75 years old, I ask him, what does he eat? And if I find that, you know, in surgery, I find the uh, bones to be very strong. The post op I ask the patient, what does he eat? What exercise does he do? Because he's an expert. He's shown that bones can be fine at 70. I'm not the expert. He's the expert because he's proved it. So like that, if we reorient our thinking, we can really learn a lot about lifestyle. That's what kindled my interest. And I've been doing it passionately ever since. Do you any formal courses uh, to lay, uh, gain knowledge and expertise on uh, lifestyle management? No, I have not. But I attend you know, all these webinars and stuff on various specialists who do this uh, stuff. Uh, but I interact with a lot of other specialists like this, you know, minor. But most important is that there's a like-minded group of uh, community of doctors, uh, predominantly from Hyderabad, who actually started this whole program that allopathic doctors must spend more time on, on health intervention, apart from disease intervention. And we really gained momentum. And we are a, we're a large group now. 
and we try to spread the message that allopathy must change its orientation. We must not, you know, view uh, health intervention through disease intervention. It's, it's something different. And as viewed that way, and this is now really pick the momentum now. So, uh, uh, welcome, Dr. Rajaram, and uh, thank you, Dr. Vijay, for uh, taking those uh, you know extempo questions. And uh, over to you to start your presentation. Uh, thanks, Dr. Vidya. First, I must uh, thank Dr. Vidya and Dr. Pata for giving me this platform. The first two talks uh, has had a very, very, very wide reach. I've had the calls from all over the world actually ask me questions, doubts, uh, things like that, and how people have helped. What has been really heartwarming is that many people wrote to me that their lives have totally changed after they followed uh, what they in the first two talks. And the good thing is a gap. And I hope some of them would give some experience as how they, they've changed. I mean, we can keep on talking a lot of theory as we do, but really how it has changed lives. And a lot of people wrote to me about that and it's been truly, truly heartwarming. So thanks, Dr. Vidya and Dr. Fatta. And with that, I will start my talk. Right. Can you see my slides, Dr. Vidya? Yes, sir. Can you go on slideshow, sir? Yes, that's slideshow, yeah. Okay. Right. So if you can't hear me or not see slides, uh, please do let me know, please. Yeah. Okay. Right. So this talk is uh, part three, which is on the second interventions. Uh, there's optimizing sleep, improving breathing, and stress reduction. So we'll concentrate on all these three today. So Dr. Vidya wanted me to give a bit of a brief on the earlier two talks so that you know people who have just joined for this talk and have not heard the previous two talks can also get a gist of what we are trying to talk about. So the first thing is we stressed earlier on that this master health check is not a not a good thing to know how healthy you are. It, it just helps you to pick up diseases. Disease intervention is fine, 20% of the population need it. But uh, if you just get normal values in a in a master health check, it doesn't mean that you have optimal health. Uh, it, it's a it's a pseudo wellness. You know, normal values, just pseudo wellness. And actually, not only pseudo wellness, you are in a pre disease state. And if you are not doing something actively, you are down in the slippery slope. And you, you are in the, towards lifestyle diseases, lifelong uh, status of taking tablets and medicines. So, unless you do something actively, all of us are in the slippery slope. And this uh, so called normal values, textbook normal values, actually is pseudo wellness. That's only pre disease. And you're waiting to develop some kind of lifestyle disease or the other. So we stress that we must do have some scientific comprehensive way, not just doing something abstract, fragmented way, but a scientific comprehensive way where we can address lifestyle diseases and how we can do lifestyle interventions. To, and then we talked about the first two talks of primary, how we get about doing that. And that's very important. So just to give a brief of uh, what we did in the previous two talks. So the primary interventions are diet. We have to have a three macro diet. We must have good calories, not eat bad calories, etc. And this must be scientific, not just, you know, saying you feel good. Now, suppose if somebody has a disease and he says, you know, he gives some disease intervention and you want objective parameters that you have really intervened in the disease. So like that, even for health intervention as allopathy, allopathy practitioners, we need to have very uh, objective landmarks. So these are the five metabolic parameters and key fitness indices, 10 of them, which we enumerated last time. But just for the people who are joined for the first time, I will go through it again. The fasting blood glucose. The HbA1c and the fasting insulin is very important. Your HSCRP for inflammation, your lipid profile is only your arthrogenic lipid diet, not LDL. We don't want to measure LDL. We want only upper B and we want to measure TGL and BLDL. And want to do a liver function test for and your ultrasound abdomen for a fatty liver, blood pressure, very important. You want to know the BMI, uh, waist circumference is absolutely critical. VO2 max, we talked about resting the plank time. You want what is your 10 rep max. Everybody, we talked about balance scores, flexibility scores. We haven't talked about sleep scores, bolt score, and stress score, which we'll talk about in this. So this is a very uh, scientific and uh, very objective way of, of finding out whether you're healthy. Not just do a mass health check, but making sure that you, do, with all these parameters, that you're doing right interventions so that you go into the correct end of the no so-called normal values. So we talked about how we can dial the diet based on how the three macros you can alter. And we talked about how you can dial your fasting, the daily fasting, as well as very rarely we do autophagy fasting, whether you plan a two meal uh, program or a three meal program or whatever. And then we talked about the four dimensional exercise program, scientific exercise program, where you have flexibility and mobility as one dimension, muscle strength and bulk as another one, stamina and endurance as another one, and burning fat and calories as another one. So these three primary interventions are absolutely crucial. Today, we'll talk about the secondary intervention. 
sleep, breathing, and stress reduction. So there are three primary, there are three secondary, and there are also three tertiary, which is sunlight, brain workout, and sleep. This sort of encompasses all that you need for any health intervention. Now, I'm sure a lot of people who are listening today have this question, and why is this guy who is an orthopedic surgeon talking on these topics? Should it be better if a sleep man of that? We have sleep medicine specialists, we have pulmonologists, we have psychiatrists. Shouldn't the pulmonologist be talking about breathing? And should the psychiatrist be talking about stress reduction? So again, I think we're confusing with disease intervention and scientific health intervention. Both are quite distinct from each other. So today I will not be covering anything like sleep apnea syndrome or COPD uh, or depression, etc. They are all organic diseases and I have nothing to do with them. The specialists will take care of them and that's sacrosanct and I will not be going into that. However, health intervention is quite different. And it's very sad that the more we specialize, the less efficient we become in health intervention. The more specialized you are, the less because healthy, as you say, you know, is a holistic concept, whereas disease intervention is focal. So we like to, again, I covered this in the last talk, is health intervention holistic or compartmentalized? Now here you have a liver and you probably have gallbladder disease and pata, you know, with all his, um, you know, endoscopy skills can do a nice polystomy. So a disease intervention can be focal, no question about that. Disease intervention needs to be focal. However, health intervention has to be holistic. If Pata says you eat some tablet like a cod liver oil tablet and your gallbladder and your liver will be fine, there's nothing more ridiculous than that. That's what we've been doing. We have been sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, interpreting health intervention as, as a part of disease intervention. That's completely wrong. So we must not divide the physical body into subspecialty ones as we do in disease allopathy. So I told in the last talk, call, calling is gut health, women wellness, bone and joint health, immune boosting, heart fitness, absolutely ridiculous. And you know, when we had this COVID epidemic, uh, pandemic, uh, people started eating uh, kilos and kilos of vitamin C for boosting their immune system. There's nothing more ridiculous than that. What is the role of vitamin C in, in the immune system? If you have a lack of vitamin C, you will have a serious problem with your immune system. But if you have adequate vitamin C, even if you eat kilos and kilos of vitamin C, your immunity will not go up even by one person. So let us all understand that. So how to improve your immune system? Simple. Three primary interventions, three secondary interventions, three tertiary interventions. That's, that's how you improve it. How to improve your heart fitness? Three primary uh, interventions, three secondary interventions, the same old story again and again. So the health intervention is holistic. So health and wellness is holistic and all organ systems are intrinsically related and interdependent. Principles of improvement and lifestyle is common to all. So it's futile to think that you can do a focal intervention and improve either your, only your joints uh, or your liver or your heart by doing a focal intervention health-wise. It's not possible. Either you are healthy or unhealthy. You can't have a, you know, a, a very healthy liver and a very unhealthy body. It just doesn't work that way. So we have made a circus of health intervention we, because we are specializing more and more. This is a recent meme that came in WhatsApp. Doctor, do you have any disease? The patient says, no. Do you take any medication? Yes, I take metformin, adrenalol, aspirin, and rosuvastatin. It is a very common scenario now. So we have really made a circus of health intervention because we are specializing more and more. I think we have to have a sort of a reset and start thinking completely differently. So we come to the topic for the day. The first thing that we're going to cover today is sleep or the lack of it. And we all know that we also lose sleep. Say that, you know, sleep well, be well, etc. We all know that there are, you know, if you're deprived of sleep, you will have a lot of minor issues like excessive sleepiness, yawning, irritability, fatigue, mood, that all we know. But what probably most of us don't know is that it can cause serious illness, absolutely serious illness. You can have cardiovascular disease, you can have pure immune, uh, poor immune system, you can have neurodegenerative conditions, um, risk of diabetes. So the same old monster that we covered in the first two talks, lifestyle diseases, whether it's diabetes, heart disease, coronary artery disease, joint pains, depression, non-alcoholic liver disease, the same old culprits come on again. So if you don't sleep well, you are asking for all these lifestyle issues. It's all one matrix. So remember that all three primary interventions play a big role in optimizing sleep. So we talked about the three primary interventions for diet. If you do clean eating and don't sort of, uh, you know, abuse your body by eating bad calories, then you feel light easier to sleep and wake up. Very important. Diet is very important in uh, getting good sleep. If you have a heavy, oily meal at 11 o'clock in the night, you're not going to sleep well. 
Now, fasting is very important. So you must have a significant period before you go to bed, three, four hours. Fasting helps in correct hormonal balance for sleep and going to bed without a full stomach. Very important. And I'm sure you all heard of that. The most effective sleeping pill is not that comes as a, as a small pill, but it's exercise. Exercise is the most effective sleeping pill that I think we all know. A healthy body gets healthy sleep. So sleep, this also is very popularly sort of uh, comes in, uh, in videos and stuff. Uh, simplified health mantra. It's not a very, very simplified for dummies. The health mantra it is, you fast 12 plus hours, you eat clean, you work out hard, you sleep deep, you repeat. You just keep doing this again and again, you probably will be healthy. It's a very uh, simplified version for dummies. So this is about sleep. We should know. We all learned about sleep during our physiology days. And then we forgot about it. We learned again when we uh, learned uh, physiology for our entrance exam, PG entrance. And again, we forgot about it. But it's very important to know the, the important components of sleep. So we have the three non-rapid eye movement uh, sleep. This, you know, your, the first stage is drowsy or awake. Second stage is light. NREM sleep and third is deep NREM sleep and then uh, apart from NREM you have REM or rapid eye movement which is stage 4 sleep. So very simple basics and everyone even if you are not doctors you should know about all this. But the most important the stage of sleep is the, the, the stage 3 or the deep uh, non-REM sleep. Here is where the body revitalizes itself. You get energy restoration, you get cell regeneration, you get hormonal replenishment, you are promoting growth and repair of tissues and bones. And the immune system gets optimized. So if you sleep well, your immune system will get better. If you eat or keep on eating a kilo of vitamin C, your immune system will not get better. So this is otherwise called a slow wave sleep or delta sleep. So this is the most important part of sleep or the stage three sleep. Now I'm sure if many of you must have heard this. You know when you do abs, you know when you want to you know make a six packs. We said you know six packs are made in the gym initially. Then we said actually six packs are not made in the gym. They're actually made in the kitchen and not in the gym. Now we know actually six packs are made while you're asleep. It's not made in the gym, it's not made in the kitchen, it's, it's made when you're asleep. So no athlete can build muscle if he doesn't have good sleep. So so, so integral, so, but we sort of we civilize it. REM sleep is also important. REM sleep is a little more complex. It's not about, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, the body doesn't rest during REM sleep. Something, some brain activity goes on, the respiration increases, heart rate actually increases, vivid dreams may occur. Uh, and then you find that the body becomes immobile because you don't want to act out your dreams. So it has got a lot of you know, psychological implications, REM sleep, and that's very important to have REM sleep as well. Temporary, temperature regulation occurs. The most important point is one should not wake up while during the stage 3 in REM sleep or REM sleep. So stage 3 deep sleep or REM sleep, one should not wake up. It's a very fundamental point which we miss. So we go through these cycles three or four times a night. So each cycle lasts about eight to uh, one ten minutes, and we go through three four uh, cycles every. Now it's very easy to know uh, how to uh, keep this, uh, how much sleep that we need. Light sleep must be less than fifty percent. REM sleep must be ten to thirty percent. Should not be more also. REM must be more than thirty percent. So very simple uh, values. Uh, light sleep less than fifty percent. REM sleep ten to thirty percent, and deep sleep. Must have minimum 20%, but more the minimal sleep is better. So nothing like you know, it's too much of deep sleep, so nothing like that. So minimum 20%, more the better. So these are simple values that everyone should keep in mind. So uh, this is the circadian rhythm that we all learned again in physiology that our body goes through various rhythms based on the day and night. And we've got to respect that. Now remember that you see the melatonin secretion starts at about 9 p.m. And then it stops at about 7 a.m. So I know a lot of people, the youngsters will say, we go, we go to bed at 2 o'clock in the night, and then we wake up only at 9 o'clock, so I got my 7 hours of sleep. That's completely illogical. It doesn't work because you're not respecting the circadian rhythm. So that, you know, this altering sleep like that is absolutely a, a, a sort of a, a passport to disease, lifestyle diseases. No question about that. So between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m., we produce the greatest amount of melatonin. Melatonin influences uh, human growth hormone secretion, and growth hormones utilize the body to burn fat, repair collagen, regenerate. Boy, I told you about the muscle. You know, you will build muscle from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock in the night. And if you don't sleep from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock in the night, you probably will not be putting on muscle. And you enhance immunity, that's when your immunity gets built, repair cells, etc. Absolutely vital. So, sleep is just as important as food and exercise when creating vibrant health. 
So we talk always about food, we talk about exercise, but we never talk about sleep. As important, equally important too. Now, people with insomnia are 10 times as likely to have clinical depression and 17 times as likely to have clinical anxiety. So please do not ignore sleep. So make sleep a priority before you lose sleep over health. So a lot of people lose sleep over health. And before you lose that, try making sleep a priority. Absolutely vital and you must pass on this message. So the next question is, how much of sleep do you need? Now, uh, most people, you know, would see these charts like this, and they'll say seven hours, and the minimum of seven hours is required. And that's what they will, uh, that's what they'll usually say. Now, this is not a, not a great thing to adhere to. It's like calorie counting, which we said in the last, uh, the first talk, that it's very bad. Calorie counting will never work in the long time. So sort of uh, sticking to seven hours is just not going to work. So what do we do now? So it's like you now putting a typically that the, the, the biggest mistake or the most common mistake that people do is they'll keep an alarm clock. Suppose you're going to bed at say uh, 11 o'clock, then they keep an alarm at six o'clock so that they get minimum seven hours of sleep. This is bad habit, but this is the most commonest habit that everyone practices. This is a very, very bad habit. Why is that? Because using an alarm to wake up is, is really wrong. So Many times, you know, we see our colleagues or ourselves in the hospital, in the surgeon's room. I mean, sure, Pata would be there. People will be just sitting there physically, but, you know, they, 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 they won't be there mentally. That's sleep inertia. They're confusion, fatigue, grogginess, poor mental and physical performance. Although they had adequate hours of sleep. Why this occurs? Because they probably woke up during a deep uh, stage three sleep or early REM stage. Because alarm went off at that stage and they woke up. That's the reason why many of us feel sleep inertia, although we have slept adequate hours. And of course, if we didn't get enough sleep, we'll have sleep inertia. So keeping an alarm to wake up is bad news. You may wake up during stage three or REM sleep. So it's crucial that you wake up when your body is replenished, when you have adequate sleep for that person. So that the amount of sleep required for each one is quite different. And you have to wake up spontaneously. That's the only way to do it. And so nowadays we have it's available on Amazon as well. If you want to have an alarm clock, you must not have a sound alarm, but you can have a light alarm. It emits a light. And then you don't wake up immediately. You get the, the breather of 10 minutes, but you pass on from the stage three to REM and you come into light sleep before you wake up. It's very important that you wake up only during light sleep. So when do you use an alarm? You use an alarm to time to go to bed because we never set an alarm for that, but we know that. Uh, the, the three variables are involved. One is the amount of sleep, variable from person to person. Somebody, you may have seven hours, I may have eight hours, somebody else may have six hours. Some people can even have five hours. Perfectly fine. It's so variable. The variable duration of sleep and the time one needs to go, go to the hospital at seven o'clock in the morning, you need to wake up. So you, you calculate in reverse and then you keep an alarm to go to bed because that's under your control. But if you wake up during stage three or audience sleep, bad news. So You've got to use the alarm for going to bed and not to wake up. So sleep hygiene, you know, is uh, refers to avoiding mistakes that damage sleep. So the most important mistake, common mistake that we all do is we take our electronic screens to bed. Whether you watch television, whether we have an iPad or watch our mobile phones, this suppresses the production of melatonin. So you know, even before you went to sleep, you already damaged your sleep because you're looking at these electronic screens just before you went to sleep. Bad news. That's very poor sleep hygiene. Now, pillow cushion, your thoracic spine is there. Your cervical spine must be in the same level as your thoracic spine. It mustn't be above, below. And if that, that damages sleep. And you avoid uncomfortable room temperature, very cold or very hot, uncomfortable bed, uncomfortable blanket. These are all very important sleep hygiene. Rooms that appear the same, whether it's the day or night, or the, uh, the, you know, whether it's the day or the night, that's a big, big, big health hazard. And I've seen a lot of rooms like that, many houses. There's very fashionable house. They've spent a lot of money, but it looks exactly the same day or night. It's a big, big health hazard. And the people living in that house very likely to develop some kind of lifestyle issues. So at your morning, your, uh, your house must look like this, full of sunlight. And of course, night, of course, it's different. So how do we improve sleep? So sleep is a function of the brain. So senses are key to our brain. So we have smell, vision, touch, sound, etc. So to get to the brain, we use a sense. Very simple as that. So subjective techniques can be used to fall asleep or increase duration of sleep. 
or increase the percentage of your state three deep sleep or optimizing your REM sleep. So we have a lot of things that we can do based on various sensors that we have, and you can really aid if you have a sleeping problem. The thing not thing not to do is to take a tranquilizer, take a trica. That's what we all do as Alapat. That's exactly what you should not do. And what you should do is utilize these techniques that we have now for health intervention, so you can get good sleep. So the first thing is, uh, you know, you can have gentle stretching or yoga uh, routines. These are not for to improve your flexibility. They're very gentle routines that make you sleepy. It's well described. You can have in your apps, in your mobile phone, sleep sounds. White noise or sound which have the same amplitude or intensity throughout the entire audible range, 20, 20,000 hertz. You know, the white sound, the sleep sounds, rain falling, waterfall, etc. You now have, and these sounds will help you sleep. That's you're using your ear as a, as, a, as, a, as a route to your brain to make you sleep. Now, image, image distraction is a very, very uh, powerful technique. This is the science behind the bedtime stories our parents told us and what we told our kids, bedtime stories. The principle is that you transport the person to somewhere else. So typically a bedtime story or what you think about must not be your work or home, because it's something distant, maybe space, maybe forest, maybe something very, in a, you know, in a place filled up snow, etc. but far from your day-to-day -day situations. And then immediately you fall asleep. So you can do it in three ways. You can either read a book like that quite far away, or you can listen. There are a lot of, uh, these are on sleep costs. You can listen to them, it transports you to somewhere else, or you can just imagine that you're going, you know, somewhere in space, etc. So these are very powerful techniques that will induce sleep. The other powerful technique is using acupressure. So you may have, you may have seen a lot of books and videos on this, but they're basically, uh, if you compare the Chinese, very popular Chinese, and the Indian acupuncture is very popular. If you compare both, there are basically five points that are common to both, which is given here. You can uh, take a you know, screenshot of this. This is exactly the points common to both, and they work extremely well. Uh, you can see the points, three fingerprints above the, uh, you know, the, the palm or crease. You can see the wind pool. Different Chinese and Indian names are there, but the same points uh, just below your head on the back and your first web space, the, the foot. And then you have a three fingerprints above your middle mildness and the ulnar border of the hand. These are the five basic points. And what you need to do is to massage them for two to three minutes with your thumb. And once you do that, you find that uh, uh, they, you know, you can go to sleep quite effectively. Very, very effective techniques apart from using track like this. Now, what about drinks? Initially, people used to say, drink a glass of milk or, you know, boil a banana and drink, but these are not good because they um, interfere with your, your, your fasting. So we don't recommend this now. The only thing that's available is, is tea. You know, any type of tea that we have, which is non-caffeine, it's not a caffeine in it, but a lot of teas can make you fall asleep. So it makes it a routine, have a, have a tea, and you fall asleep. Then there are other techniques to, uh, uh, in this sleep would be uh, breathing techniques, which I'll cover in the other topic on breathing. And then there's something known as progressive muscle relaxation techniques. You start from your head to toe or toe to head, you relax each part of your body, and as you keep relaxing them, you go to sleep. They're all very, very effective techniques. And these two are techniques to improve quality of sleep, so that your deep sleep is better, not to fall asleep. Here you have deep sleep better meditation. Again, you have apps for that, and they will guide you. And once you listen to them, your, your deep sleep can get better. So again, same guided uh, programs for hypnosis for sleep. Hypnosis, as we know, is a very effective tool for most people, but about a quarter of the people will not respond to hypnosis. If you respond, it's great. If you find that your deep sleep is lacking, it's a good way to go about it. Monitoring of sleep today is excellent. We have all these fitness devices and they'll give you a snapshot of how you have slept. I find it to be extremely, extremely, extremely accurate. Uh, how much of light sleep you had, deep sleep you had, REM sleep you had, and your sleep score was it good. It's getting better with all these interventions or not. It's getting worse or it's stressed out. Everything is beautifully monitored and strongly suggest that you get a, uh, a, a device like that that monitor your sleep. So, so, so effective these days. So uh, most companies are quite uniform in how they now present itself. And I think it's a great tool. Just like a pulse oximeter was so useful in the COVID pandemic, I think these devices are now extremely useful. Our people who don't have this device, you can use your cell phone itself. And there's an app called a sleep scope. This you got to just keep it near your bed and this uses sonar, just like a bat. And it's quite surprising that it actually picks up it quite well. You can find out you know, what is your deep sleep, audience sleep, et cetera, just by 
keeping it near your uh, bedside, uh, just your app, the phone. There's no need for a fitness device. This also works very well. This app is called a sleep score. We go to part two now, which is improving breathing. So whether whatever types of breathing that you have, whether it's Thayos breathing, whether it's our Indian yogic breathing, or whether it's Chinese Qigong or sea breathing, whatever it is, the common principle is that correct breathing is diaphragmatic or belly breathing. I'm quite shocked that many, many doctors simply don't know that. Whenever we call, say, deep breathing, we immediately puff up our chest. That's what is our, you know, when we ask, we ask the patient to puff their chest up. That is wrong breathing. That is chest breathing. But most doctors think that is deep breathing. Very surprising that most doctors don't know the correct breathing is diaphragmatic. So whichever system of breathing that you go into, the common, the common principle, correct breathing is diaphragmatic or belly breathing. Uh, there's no doubt about that. So, and then what else we can do in breathing is there are specific breathing techniques that can help you in various ways. So, we'll cover a bit of that. So, the correct breathing technique is diaphragmatic or belly breathing. So, when you inhale, your belly must come out, not your chest. The belly must come out. And as you know, babies and children have abdominal breathing like this. But as we grow older, probably because we don't want others to see our tummies, we sort of stop doing this type of correct breathing and we are short. Uh, chest breathing is very bad for health and uh, the correct breathing is diaphragmatic breathing or belly breathing. Now, when you do chest breathing, it's very shallow breathing. You get prone for infections and all your lifestyle, again, diseases, your diabetes, your heart disease, your joint problems, all these come when you don't do correct breathing. Now, look at this. Now, we do chest breathing, the volume of the air you inspire is so little, but you do correct abdominal breathing, it's many, many times more of the air you can inhale. So we must all start learning to breathe diaphragmatic uh, for a healthy lifestyle. Now, whatever type you take, you see yogic breath, inhale to the nose and your stomach pushes out during inhalation. And during exhalation, your stomach goes in. But most people, especially allopathic doctors, would actually do the reverse. So chest breathing is shallow breathing and inherently flawed. So deep breathing benefits, again, all these lifestyle issues, heart disease, liver disease, uh, uh, mental issues, everything, same old monster again. If you don't want your the lifestyle diseases, you've got to breathe properly. Sleep properly, you've got to breathe properly as well. And there's a Taoist famous statement which says, to breathe fully is to live fully, to manifest the full range of power of our inborn potential for vitality in everything that we sense, feel, think and do. So breathing is as important as, correct breathing is as important as sleeping. The common uh, mistake to think is that correct breathing should be done only when you do some asanas or when you're doing meditation. That's completely wrong. Breathing must be done all the time. So when you're in a car, for example, somebody else is driving, when you're watching a movie, when you're reading a book, when you're listening to something, when you're sitting in a class, sitting, listening to somebody talk, it's a good time for you to practice good abdominal breathing. Absolutely. So throughout the day, you keep practicing abdominal breathing. So again, just like sleep, we have various techniques by which we can improve our breathing and they have specific purposes. So you can have, you can work with ratios, you can have breath awareness, you can have pattern breathing, you can have vocal breathing, you can have breathing for cleansing or you can have wall breathing. You briefly, the first thing is mindful breathing. Mindful abdominal breathing is the simplest form of meditation. So we all, you know, just be aware of the breath going in and coming out without being a big, you know, big in yogic science and all that, just simple common sense. Just be aware of your breathing. And it's got tremendous, tremendous benefits. This is a very famous statement. Feelings come and go like clouds in a windy sky. Conscious breathing is my anchor. So, you know, whenever possible, be aware of your breath. Simple common sense. And it will be, it will give you tremendous health benefits. And next is working with ratios. Now, we have four phases of breathing. You can inhale, hold, exhale, hold. So, you have four. Inhale, hold, exhale and hold. Now, how is the proportion going to be? We'll give you different benefits. So, if suppose we have inhalation is less four and exhalation is eight, whether it's seconds or counts, then you find you get a very relaxing effect. In other words, you find that you have one to ratio, inhalation one to exhalation two, you have a very relaxing. So, we talked about sleep. So, if we do this kind of a breathing where you do an one is two ratio, then you find you've got a very relaxing effect. But as you come down this chart and you have more equal inhalation and exhalation, then it's called balanced breathing, more towards balancing. And if you push it more, it becomes energizing. So just by altering the inhalation time, hold time, exhalation time, and hold time, you're able to 
order what effect that you want with breathing. So this four, seven, eight breathing is a very, very popular technique. Uh, very extremely popular, very useful as well. So I think everyone should know about this four, seven, eight uh, technique. And this is called as a natural tranquilizer. Not taking Rika, but taking this is a natural tranquilizer. Four, seven, eight breathing. Okay. So work, working with ratios for so the the other type. So we talked about you know one is two ratio. Now the other one when both are equal is called as box breathing. Again, very very popular technique used world over. When you breathe in for four seconds, you hold your breath for four seconds. You breathe out for four seconds, then hold your breath for four seconds. Very very popular technique. And of course, in our Indian yoga team, called as samavritti or equal breathing. Again, the same technique. It's also called as Navy SEAL technique. So in high pressure situations, in the Army, the Navy, etc., the, the Army personnel have taught this, this technique of box breathing, where they do this technique and immediately they get calm. You know, how high pressure situations that you have during war, etc., they are all taught, Navy SEALs, etc., do this box breathing and immediately calm you down. It won't put you to sleep, it won't tranquilize you, but you'll have a calming effect. So simple breathing techniques, so, so important for a healthy lifestyle. Firstly, uh, lip breathing is when you have uh, short of breath for any reason. Suppose you go to a crowded place or a room without ventilation, and you find that you, you are short of breath. And then the simplest thing to do is on an aircraft, for example. The simple things would be would be to do first lip breathing, where you take a simple inhalation and you purse your lip and you exhale to a count of four. Inhale to a count of two. And first lip breathing will, of course, open up your alveoli. And therefore, it becomes a very efficient, keeps the airways open for longer and helps to open up the alveoli. Like. So if, if you are, for any reason, if you are difficult in breathing, the thing to do would be a first lip breathing. Vocal breathing, a very popular technique is bumblebee breathing. Lot of effects, again, same anti-lifestyle disease effects, calms the mind, nervous system, boosts immunity, reduces blood pressure, absolutely. Uh, this, of course, we inhale and when we exhale, we, call, we, we make the sound of a, uh, of a bee. Brahmari in Sanskrit refers to the bee or the wasp. Now, this uh, Ramdev's Kapalbhati, you would have seen uh, in videos and in uh, television, he made it very popular. This is breath for cleansing. Suppose you go to a crowded place, go to a movie theater, go to a hospital. These days, is the day of Corona. You want to go to a hospital and you come back. It's very important that you cleanse your respiratory system by doing something for cleansing. The most popular one is Kapalbhati, as shown here. But it's a very more violent way of breathing where you exhale all your alveoli and all your whatever you inhale completely and, and your abdomen goes, exhalation means the abdomen goes in, abdominal breathing. So that's couple body breathing. Now the other type of, uh, uh, you know, the uh, breathing for cleansing, uh, so you have, is the um, bashtrika uh, breathing. That's the rapid forceful breathing. Here you find that both inhalation and exhalation are both forceful. Whereas in Kapal Bhati, only the expression is forceful. Inspiration is natural. Whereas in Bastrika, you find that both inspiration and expression are both uh, forceful. So these are breathing techniques that you use for cleaning. Whenever you go to a hospital, for example, it's a good thing to do when you come back. And these are, of course, known as Kriyas or cleansing uh, techniques. Pattern breathing. Pattern breathing is more for children and things like that, where you know they count their you know fingers, where they inhale and exhale, but they don't understand uh, more uh, you know this inhalation exhalation. You can ask them to uh, do this is known as starfish breathing. Again, for adults also for patients you can where you start becoming aware of your breath. Again, it's got a lot of benefits. And apart from starfish, you have a lot of other uh, you know shapes that you can use for any type of pattern breathing. Now again. There's now objective assessment of breathing. Uh, so this is known as the bone score. This is not the maximum breath holding time. Most a lot of people think this is the amount of time that you hold your breath. No, that's not how you objectively assess your breathing capacity. How good is your breathing? This is a bone test. Bone test means you take a small breath in. You don't take a deep breath in. Take just take a small breath in, and then you it goes by itself. You breathe out naturally, and then the time that you take till you see the first signs of air hunger, whether your axillary respiratory muscles start working or you are, you are starved of breath, that is the time. It's not your maximum breath hold time. So just a natural time that you need before you get air hunger. That's your test. Very objective scores are now available, the bone score. So whether from zero to nine would be very bad, high scores of 60, 70 would be great. And based on the time, 
because average, so basically, if you are over 25 or okay, but less than 25, you got some serious problem. You need to do some serious exercises like yogic pranayama, something like that. You have to do to improve your breathing. You go to the third topic of the day would be reducing stress. Uh, actually, de stressing is similar to falling asleep. So, principles are the same. So, you use your, your senses to relieve stress, either the sound, smell. This is we all know. You can listen to music, you can have some aromatherapy. You can have some natural tea. You can do uh, Jinshin Jutsu. That uh, I'm sure you all heard of that. Where your five fingers represents different things that you worry about. Fear, anger, sadness, self-esteem, poor self-esteem, etc. And you massage these fingers. You'll get this is a very popular Japanese technique that you have. You can manage to exercise a great uh, stress buster. We know that. You go for a jog. Uh, and of course, you can have sight. You can watch a cartoon, for example. These are all very well-known. Uh, things of how you manage stress. But more importantly, the real thing is how to prevent stress. That's what I'll be concentrating on. So remember the seven P's. You can take a screenshot of the seven P's. It's peaceful life yourself. You need to have some peer group activity. You need to practice a mindfulness. You must pinpoint the source of your stress, prayer and spirituality, prioritize the right things in life, and the purpose of life. These are the seven P's to help you in preventing stress. So the first is peaceful life and yourself. Uh, and yourself. This is the most important prayer that we have, the serenity prayer. Okay, now everyone should do this prayer every day. Everything I think is, so the prayer is, of course, we all know this prayer. Is, God grant me the serenity to accept things I cannot change, courage to change things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. If we say this prayer every day, I think half your stress will go away. Now, there are things that we cannot change. The only thing you can do is you can bang your head somewhere about that thing. You can't do anything about that. So, Wasting your energy, wasting your life force, etc. on that is absolutely ridiculous. However, we are not totally sort of, you know, uh, you know, detached. You must always focus on things that you can change. So this prayer is for two things. Serenity, to accept things that you cannot change, but really, really focus on things that you can change. So if you accept that, then you are in peace with life and yourself. Peer group activity is a, is a must. Peer group refers to a group which have sort of equal mind, you know, your, your subordinates at work or your boss at work are not your peer group because you're not interacting with them at the same level. So you must have somebody who's your peer group. And then only so you can have some activity like, you know, some, some cycling, jogging, sports, etc. You can have something together as poetry, uh, music appreciation, whatever it is, or you can play some music instrument, whatever it is. But you must have some peer group activity, absolutely, because they're social animals. Without peer group activity, you will become a recluse. And that is a sure, sure way of getting sick. All these three things are so important for overall well-being. So practice of meditation and mindfulness is the other important thing to prevent stress. Now, a lot of people confuse meditation with various other things. Meditation is not what meditation is not going to a very remote place and thinking of something esoteric, not at all. So meditation is a practice to achieve a meditated state. Just like how we sleep. The brain goes into sleep. We all know what sleep is. We all know how to get to sleep. Similarly, there is a meditated state. It is a physical state, just like sleep. And uh, reaching a meditated state has numerous benefits, but it's not a biological function. It's got tremendous benefits. But unlike sleep, it's not a biological function. That's why we don't concentrate on that. In the meditated state, the body is relaxed, the mind is quiet, and the spirit is awakened. So four techniques are used for meditation. One is mindfulness. Focus, chanting as guided, and open awareness. These are the four techniques that are always used in meditation. So again, the same old uh, thing. Meditation is lowers blood pressure, it prevents diabetes, it fights heart disease, relieves anxiety, improves your bones and joints, exactly improves fertility. Exactly the same. Again, the same old lifestyle disorders that we have now. So whichever part of meditation that you take, whether it is Chinese, Taoist, Buddhist, Hindu, uh, yogic. It's all the same thing. It's all the same thing. So don't confuse meditation with religion, etc. So types of meditation, as I told you, you know, you can either concentrate on something, or you can be mindful of something, or you can call it open monitoring. You, are, you sort of detach yourself and see what's happening. So this is the very simple. So just like falling asleep, it is just a practice like any other activity. You practice these things, then you reach a meditated state. Once you reach a meditated state, it gives you tremendous benefits, tremendous benefits, especially uh, fighting stress. The third piece, positivity. 
positivity is being prepared for happiness we all say we want to be happy and that's the goal of life but we are not positive we are negative about most things so just like you know uh, you know if you are very um, uh, you know if you are very uh, what do you say uh, um, what do you call industrious you will be very lucky so if your industriousness you know you being prepared for luck just like that you find that positivity is being prepared for happiness if you are not positive it's very unlikely that you're going to be happy so happiness is a mood positivity is a mindset so only if you're positive you you will get opportunities to be happy if you're not positive you're not going to be happy and you're going to be stressful so we all know about the happiness chemicals you have learned them dopamine oxytocin serotonin and endorphins are all the happiness chemicals which all secrete due to various things that we can see that we all know about this but unless you have positive attitude none of these um, hormones are going to secrete in you so positivity is absolutely critical and unless you have positivity you cannot experience happiness so to be prepared for a happiness you must be positive purpose of life uh, this i think we uh, you know ikigai now very well known japanese ikigai people think ikigai is uh, is you know what you do in past time you know you do some kind of uh, you know past time that you do that is ikigai ikigai is not that ikigai is is something that Uh, you know the the purpose of your being you now we always refer to this term as you know god given gift somebody has this god given gift for surgery or whatever so that guys ikigai is surgery so ikigai is something that you are intrinsically very good at it's not a hobby it's something that you are very good at and that you pursue it may be a profession may not be a profession there's one of my batch mates from madras uh, cardiothoracic surgeon who is such a good writer but only recently we know that he is such a good writer writing was his ikigai now he writes a lot absolutely brilliant writing that's ikigai also is a kind of project so just like that we all have our ikigai so unless we find what our ikigai is we are all talented at something intrinsically talented god given talent and we find that we may not uh, you know uh, live to our full potential so we must be look out of what our ikigai is and once we do our ikigai our mind and body is is sort of uh, is satisfied okay so that is the ikigai finding your ikigai for the purpose of life it may not be a profession is not a hobby but finding what you know activity that you are born to do you know could be photography could be whatever it is but you must be intrinsically good not practice and good you must be intrinsically good at it and that's your so if you don't find your ikigai you cause stress pray and spirituality so we talked about mind and body ikigai is finding what is uh, you know your mind and body needs um, you know that's the ikigai that's one more element to our existence that spirit and ignoring the spirit is a common cause of stress if you don't look out for uh, for spirit you're going to cause stress so all humans whether you acknowledge it or not they're all essentially spiritual beings whether you acknowledge it or not so spirituality is recognizing the following you recognize that something more in everyone than just the physical organs put together so if somebody is patta but that is not just his organs but is something more than that that's his, his spirituality so we can then also be you know we can experience something more than just the sensory ones apart from hearing uh, you know smelling and touching there is a something that's a higher experience and that is spirituality and that we are part of a greater whole in this universe whether it's called cosmos you know whatever god whatever you want to call it but we are part of a larger whole and that is spirituality and exercise for spirituality is called prayer prayer is not what you think it is exercise for spirituality when you connect with your spirit this part of a bigger thing and not just isolated then we call it prayer so we are all essentially spiritual beings although some people will say that you know that they are not spiritual there's nobody like that you just not identify your spirituality and, and if you don't identify your spirituality you are you are always you know uh, you are not restful you are always a state of unrest until you find your spirituality because we are made of mind body and spirit we, we know how to take care of the mind and body we also should take care of the spirit we tell you not religion religion is what practices or rituals should i follow what is right and wrong what is true and false spirituality is quite different where do i find meaning how do i connect with the spirit how do i feel connected to the larger being how should i live so spirituality and don't confuse spirituality and religion so then the, the next piece prioritizing to remove worry now i find that the four top worries for indians are the following we all worry about our health 
we worry about dependence. What if something happens to me? What do my dependents do? And we all worry about children's wedding and we all worry about retirement. These are the common worries that colleagues that we have mine and everybody have. Now, again, you know, it's very important that serenity prayer, not the first part. And we, of course, we cannot accept, we, can, we have to accept the things that we cannot change, but we must constantly do things that we can change. And all these four things we can change. Therefore, we must act on them. It's so, so critical. The first thing is we all are most worried about health, but we never do anything for health. And we now told you in three talks what to do for health intervention. So you must actually do it. And then you probably have taken care of health. Now, what about dependence? So how much of life insurance you should buy? I keep asking them to everybody I meet, you know, my friends and colleagues. People, are, you know, usually, you know, have life insurance for the sake of it. A lot of people may not know, but the minimum life insurance that you must have must be 10 times your annual income. Suppose you, your income is one crore a year. You must be insured for 10 crores. So if you die, your family will get 10. That's the minimum. You can have more than you want. Now, once you have the amount insured, you feel dying is not a bad thing, you know. 10 crores is a lot of money. 10 times your annual income is a lot of money. for So you feel not bad dying. The family also not, I suppose, don't feel bad when you're dying, you know. So you can't take care of it. You can't take care of your worries. It's not difficult. Children's wedding, you know, only in India and in Greece, we have this exorbitant wedding, uh, wedding spending tens of crores. And we work for 30 years of productive life to spend on two days of wedding. I think this, this exorbitant wedding must be banned. We should not have these weddings because this is led to a lot of, uh, you know, problems and worry, uh, sickness, illness and all that because we have such a big expenditure. I think we should have a very limited exposure. We may tell our kids, this is the expenditure that I've saved for your wedding, limited. And that's what we'll have to use. I think the government must, especially post-COVID, I think the government must ban all these exorbitant weddings. Then we take care of an important worry for Indians. Retirement. Now, re regarding retirement, uh, you know, we want to keep on making money, 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 for a, you know, because we don't know what we're going to do in retirement. What you put in, you know, you tabulate what I'm going to do in retirement. I'm going to travel to these 10 places. I'm going to, you know, probably play bridge. I'm going to probably do some gardening. And then once you tabulate that, you find the expense very limited. Why do you want 100 crores for that? Why? So once you tabulate what you want for retirement, it is very easy to provide for that. So all four of this, which seems to be the top worries for Indians, can actually be taken care of quite nicely. But instead of taking care of them, we keep worrying, 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 worrying. And that's the reason why we develop the problem. So finally, coming to quantifying stress. Now we have these excellent uh, tools. Uh, that's by, you know, the, the same uh, watch that I have. It gives you an excellent, and one day, you know, if I had a stressful surgery, you know, some complication has occurred, thing like that, it'll show you so brilliantly that, that you are under stress. So please do not ignore these uh, tools that we have. Uh, very important tools. Please do not uh, sort of uh, dismiss them as, you know, as, as toys. Uh, technology is catching up. I mean, who would have thought that we, in our lifetime, we'll be driving battery operated cars? So all of us are going to drive battery operated cars in the next five years. Who would have thought? So these are these technology has caught up so well, and it, it picks up stress so beautifully. So don't ignore this technology. I'll give you stress, and you know that whatever you're doing is stressful, and you know whatever you're doing not stressful, and all these interventions that I talk about, and you do it, and how your stress gets addressed. So so important for being healthy. So again, we go to our uh, template. So we talked about the primary interventions in the first two talks. Now we talked about the secondary, how do you optimize sleep? Uh, not in the duration, but the quality of sleep. How do you do improving breathing? And for specific benefits, uh, you, you, uh, you have to use various breathing techniques for specific benefits. Stress reduction is very important. Once you apply your mind to stress reduction, it's actually not that difficult to do stress reduction. And once you do this, you're always updated. These are not, you know, subjective parameters. You'll find that updated parameters. But what is very interesting is that some people have told me they've done all these primary interventions. Still, uh, you know, they, they have not had a positive impact on all these values. And then once they start doing second intervention, there's really a, a beautiful impact on that. Very pronounced impact on that. So all these impact is good. Uh, tertiary is also important, but they're very straightforward. Sunlight, brain workout, and clean air. And with that, you would be able to. So I uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks again, Dr. Vidya and Pata. Thank you for that uh, wonderful talk, sir. Uh, over to you, uh, Meenal and uh, Ramya. Yeah.
Yes, go. Can you hear me? All right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, we can hear you. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, could you stop sharing your screen, sir? Yeah, just one second. Yeah, got it, yeah. yeah. Uh, firstly, I would like to congratulate you. I think the audience uh, seems to be very happy. We have a lot of people saying excellent presentation, and I can't agree more with it because uh, this, I think, is, a, is the need of the art. You know, I was recently reading about uh, so many I'll speak for my own speciality, so many anesthesiologists, you know, who are actually committing suicide and they are undergoing a lot of mental health issues. And it does become extremely important for us to focus on all these primary as well as secondary interventions. And of course, the tertiary ones, which you also mentioned. Uh, so I have a few observations to make, sir. Firstly, I will talk about the, the, the sleep, you know, the sleep you said. So there was University of Colorado, actually. They've done a small study where they put people without sleep, like they just decreased the number of hours to just about for just about five days. Five days was the only time. And in those five days, they realized by decreasing the hours of sleep from eight to four, people gained one kg of weight. So that, you know, that uh, I think uh, the audience should take, take away from this that what Sir was saying is so important because it is directly proportional to your mortality. Also, the ghrelin hormone, which is there in you know, which is called the growling hormone of the, of the tummy, the stomach, that also starts increasing actually when when you sleep less, and it asks you to get into this binge eating and little bit of eating here and there. So, my question to you, sir, here is that there are many of us, you know, we are young mothers or even some uh, middle-aged people. We have we get up many times during the night. We have uh, you know young kids to attend to. And maybe we slept just for four hours and we get up and we could feed them or maybe whatever. It's difficult to get back to sleep. So people, what they do is after the four hours, they, they don't sleep. They begin working on their laptops or on their phones. And then they think that they don't need them. So would you like to give them a little bit of a dose on it's important to go back or something like that? Well, obviously, it's not the ideal situation when you're forced to wake up at night time. Uh, when you have a baby and things like that. But of course, you compensate, you at least compensate for the total duration of sleep. So when you can sleep in the daytime, uh, you should, uh, so that you have at least a total, although you know your deep sleep, your continuity of deep sleep, etc., will get affected. So all those things are there, but you must have this total, suppose for your, somebody that seven hours of sleep is what they need, they must try and compensate as much as possible so that you are able to at least partially, uh, not the best situation, but at least a, but it's a temporary phase in time. You'll of course, get over it soon. So then I think, you know, you need to compensate in the daytime for that. As you said, what you should not do is, you know, look at your uh, cell phones and be busy with WhatsApp during that period. Yeah. You must compensate for sleep loss as much as possible. Also, do you, do you suggest uh, catching up sleep and naps in the afternoon? Is yes, it good so, to sleep uh, in the afternoon? Yeah, it's a, the afternoon nap, a nap is a controversial topic. But I think they, uh, what is now known as a, a, a large amount of sleep during afternoon is not a good idea. It interface with the sleep at night. But you know, a cat nap or you know, a 10 15 minute sleep is supposed to energize you. And a lot of people do that. And I think that's perfectly fine. But sleeping for two, three hours in the afternoon is certainly not a good idea. And that's going to uh, interfere with your deep sleep at night. Certainly, it's going to interfere with that. Okay, sir. So my next question, sir, comes uh, uh, it's an audience question. Actually, I want to know. You spoke about all the breathing techniques, the abdominal breathing and the various pranayams which we do. So I would like to know how much time one should devote during the day to do these techniques. And I think we should just stress enough that it's not necessary to give half an hour. Even a little bit time would be sufficient, I think. So if you would want to say something. So yeah, thanks. So that's what I said in my talk. You know, so we don't we're all busy in our day-to-day -day routines and we don't have time, especially for sitting down and breathing for 20 minutes. So you have to combine it with daily activity, you know. Uh, when you're doing surgery, when you're giving anesthesia and you're sitting down, that's when you do your breathing techniques. You know, traveling in a car, uh, you know, reading something, watching a lecture, listening to a lecture. That's the time you do breathing. Breathing is not something that you go to a very quiet place and then you start breathing. Breathing is what abdominal breathing and the correct breathing and being aware, aware of your breathing is what you do as a, as a second nature. That's what babies do. That's what you must do all the time. So whenever I get time, you know, I, I try and breathe correctly. Even when I'm doing sports, and you know, this type of breathing is so important in all sporting activities. A lot of coaches will, will tell you that's a very important thing. So when you're jogging, when you're walking, that's the time you breathe correctly. It's, a, it's a second nature to you. It must be second nature to you. 
it's not something in our busy lives you don't have time to go and spend half an hour on breathing that probably is okay theoretically but it won't work in real life so there's a question which says that you know uh, we have an audience uh, he says that i'm 76 years of age and i get up two to three times at night uh, you know to attend the nature's call so is it fine or you know should he control it well it's not fine suddenly because you are getting interrupted there too much so you must find out what is your, uh, your problem you know prostate problem or etc and then you must fix it really that's the way to go and maybe you, you know once or twice okay but frequently it's not is going to interfere with sleep and you're going to have sleep problems no question about that yeah uh, uh, what is your problem that making you wake up you must fix it hi uh, ramya you have anything to add um i think we should also keep in mind the age right um and uh, uh, the significance of it in getting up in the middle of the night um so it is one thing for uh, uh, you know uh, for for angster to get up in the middle of the night and uh, uh, there are other factors and elements that are involved in um, an older person getting up in the middle of the night uh, 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 Professor Rajaram, you wanted to uh, ask Dr. Vijay something. Could you please unmute yourself, sir? Yeah, Vijay, it was an excellent presentation. But I want to know how would you like us to translate the message that you have given so far to the members of the community? Because that is where is very important for us to convey. Yes, that's uh, that's a problem, um, and especially for patients. You know, somebody asks you. um how can i uh, avoid joint pains now i cannot uh, talk three hour lecture on this to the patient that seems to be the problem neither can i give a one word answer to him uh, it's a very tough uh, thing especially for a patients but for the community i have done this program in so many uh, you know uh, forums uh, you know my club my so many for, for rotary everywhere i have done and that is the very really pass on the message like a domino effect so i think whatever we can do Your own, you know, your relatives, uh, you know, relatives, your friends, circles. You have to pass the message. I think that's the way to do it. Yeah, will you agree with me that all of us should contribute towards teaching and imparting education to the community? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. For yeah, uh, Vidya Amit Lutra has kept his hand raised for a long time. Please, sir. Let Let me introduce Amit Lutra before he asks the question. Amit Lutra is a is a Arjuna Awardee. He has been uh, given the Arjuna Award. He is uh, currently in our hospital. I've done a hip surgery on him. Uh, oh. He's been representing India in golf for 30 years. Currently, he also uh, represents India. He is a recipient of the Arjuna Award, and currently he's in the Sims Hospital floor. I mean, yes, I mean. Great. You had stolen the lines I was going to speak. So I was uh, about three months back uh, in Cleveland for my sister's open heart, and. Uh, Luckily, I met Dr. Brooks, uh, who spoke very highly of Dr. Bose, and also Dr. Ashok Kumar. And till then, I had met all the heavy hitters, orthopedic surgeons from Delhi, Medanta, Gangaram, etc. And nobody even told me about uh, resurfacing. Only when Dr. Brooks recommended uh, Dr. Bose's name, I did some study, and I said, "Okay, that's the way to go." So, anyways, coming back to it, I thought he was a good. Uh, Um, orthopedic, but I think after his talk today, I have to change my views. I think his views on you know the uh, serenity, the breathing, etc., is slightly better than his uh, <laughs> 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 taking away from there. <clears throat> so, so doctor, I would like to ask you one question. In this pandemic situation, the second wave has just gone. Third is expected. Second was very bad because everybody has lost some near and dear ones. i mean without exception first was still okay we were hearing people are losing but you know they were in the periphery but in the second wave everybody has lost and with the bombardment of the print media electronic media is not helping matters luckily now it's subsided a bit but till about a month back uh, people were losing sleep they didn't know what to do uh, they were overworked you know it was like doomsday so in that situation how do you i mean it's easier said than done that you do pranayama and you do meditation and all but in practically how do you actually do it because when push comes to shove and it happens to you that's the time you realize that yes 
you know, it's a very, very grave situation. So what is the cure? I mean, not cure, but what is the way forward in that? Yeah, coping, coping with stress is a different, um, you know, topic by itself. However, it's been my observation and other doctors can pitch in that the people, uh, you know, who developed a serious version of the COVID disease were people who were unfit or had lifestyle issues. It's again been published. So all these people, you know, who are good in diet, exercise, fasting, sleeping, breathing, etc., they, they didn't get a serious form of the, of the disease. And that has been a very important observation. So that's probably why, because their immunity level was good or whatever. And then, you know, the same answer to all lifestyle issues. How to avoid the COVID, uh, not vitamin C, but think of all these three primary, three secondary, and three tertiary thing there. But coping with stress once, that's a different topic, which, uh, you know, is, is a talk by itself. Yeah. So I'm not able to address this now. Yeah. <laughs> With yeah, Galaxy M21 also is the hand raised for quite a while. Whoever that is, please. Galaxy M21. Uh, can you unmute and ask a question? Yeah, but uh, there's no response. Okay, till such time, uh, Ramya, would you like to uh, uh, take the previous question? Um. Uh, yes, as uh, Dr. Vijay uh, mentioned, uh, I think uh, uh, we need to have an overall picture and, you know, we, we need to work, you know, through the stress management, we need to divide it into multiple parts and work through, you know, smaller goals to achieve uh, a better management of the whole uh, situation. Um, uh, if I may add, um, it has been an excellent, excellent presentation, Dr. Vijay, and uh, you know, you have covered a lot of things, Ikigai, Kigong, Yoga, Tai Chi, Mindfulness, uh, you know, a plethora of options that you have given us today. Um, this is a very, very relevant topic to all of us, you know, who is living in this pandemic era, um, going through uncertain times. Uh, so many of us are uh, having sleep disturbances, and I would really like to highlight the plight of pain patients you know, uh, in, uh, here in this space, and I think it is very, very relevant um, uh, to the presentation that you made today, Doctor. So, um, the the connection, the, the the relationship the pain patients have with sleep is very tumultuous. Um, you know, um, uh, again, I mean, uh, no good sleep, uh, they're not able to sleep well in the night because of the pain. They get up in the morning. There is no regeneration, no repair, no restoration. Again, the pain is, uh, pain is pronounced in the morning. Um, you know, it, it, it is really, really tough on them. Uh, we, uh, in our uh, Synapse Pain Clinic, we are a team of uh, professionals. We are very focused towards the patient outcome, and we engage in multidisciplinary approach. Um, along with the pharmacological interventions, uh, when we are uh, using other techniques, you know, when we encourage our patients to, um, uh, you know, follow sleep hygiene, uh, to have a nice environment, as you said, to dim the lights, you know, multiple things that we do, which are actually proving very, very effective. Um, after the point in time, we'll be able to even come up with data as to how it is very effective, uh, you know, um, in their sleep cycle management. Um, so if I would you like to add something on uh, st coping with stress, uh, uh, Mr. Amit Luthra's question? Um, want to unmute yourself, Meena? Ravi, Ravi Shankar, yeah. Uh, can I speak? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay. Yeah, so basically, you know, in the, in the psychological first aid, they teach us about this whole thing about coping with stress, which is a very different uh, presentation as per said. But the first thing is to actually recognize those signs of stress which are beginning to happen in you. It can be cognitive, it can be psychological, it can be social, it can be withdrawal, hopelessness, helplessness. And then the second thing is actually to, uh, to first to recognize and then to listen to people. Either Either you listen to yourself and ask for help, or there is somebody else who observes these changes in you and gives you that help. 
So it's also very important that we as individuals, when we are trying to help others in dealing with stress, we have to have that patience and that non-judgmental nature, I think. It's important to listen with empathy. That is very important. And there is a very mild difference between empathy and sympathy. The empathy is when, when I put myself in somebody else's shoes. And sympathy becomes when I start attaching feelings to it. So it's important that we actually listen to them so that they feel they are uninterrupted without saying, oh, this happened with me also. Then they feel there's a disconnect. And also give people time and let them understand that it's normal. Like, for example, you spoke about COVID, Mr. Alutra. So it's normal for people to get admission. There are people dying, you're getting affected, etc., etc. So tell them that this kind of dealing with stress is normal for about 14 days or 15 days, you know, when they are going through that grief and all that is normal. And then comes the third part of linking people or yourself if you realize that you are falling a trap to certain social groups. It starts with family, friends, and also lots of other social groups where you can get this help like meditation groups, spirituality groups. So this is my answer to it. Ravi, you want to say very something? Well said, yeah. uh, what Dr. Meena said um, is very, very true. The first thing starts with first accept, acknowledging, accepting, and normalizing. Uh, you know, and uh, I mean, when 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 you normalize, uh, then you you believe that you are not alone. You understand that so many people are going through this along with you, which makes a lot of difference in the way that you know we react and respond to our situations. Uh, Ravi, you want to say something? Oh, sure. Thanks. Um, excellent talk, Vijay. Uh, very uh, extensive and uh, probably will need uh, repeated watching to go through uh, each individual um, aspect, like Kimu said. Um, a couple of comments. One is, you know, with, with respect to sleep, there's a lot of uh, uh, evolving data from like Yves Cotier and other people who very clearly demonstrate that there is a J point, uh, J shaped curve with sleep and outcomes. Like for everything, uh, every other biological thing, about six to seven hours of sleep is appropriate. Too little is bad, too much is bad as well. So there's a, you know, like a Goldilocks moment uh, for this as well. Um, and then um, the other thing that uh, is uh, very uh, interesting, I mean, this is something that I want you to um, uh, sort of help people understand. So these watches like I, uh, uh, um, uh, the Apple Watch, etc., they give you, uh, they look at sleep and they say deep sleep and light sleep. So deep sleep, is that the same as stage three sleep or is it, a com you know, is it multiple? How do they do that? That was going to be one question. And second is, how do you, um, I mean, what would your advice be to people who do a lot of international travel, going across time zones, jet lag, and, you know, sleep deprivation because of jet lag? Because these days, everybody is expected to hit the ground running, whatever time zone you're in, right? So those would be my two questions for you. Yeah, the um, uh, the devices, I think uh, the, uh, the deep sleep refers to the stage three sleep, but REM sleep comes differently. So REM is different. REM is also some people consider a deep sleep, but this one comes differently. So a stage three would be deep sleep. That is, I think, what they refer to all the devices, I think, or at least most devices. But I think it's very accurate. And whenever I found, you know, whenever I found very grogginess in the morning and etc., then I look back at my sleep score, very accurate, absolutely accurate that my deep sleep has not been adequate for that day. And whenever I feel energized in the morning, I always look back. Now, these are not absolute values, but it helps one to compare yourself, whether you are doing the right thing or the wrong thing. Now, it may not be an absolute score to say, okay, I have great sleep, not like that, but are you on the right track or in the wrong track? But that is absolutely, absolutely fantastic. So please don't ignore your... Regarding international flights and, you know, time zones... Uh, on various techniques that we told you to get sleep. So as long as you sleep well on a flight, uh, you the jet lag is uh, is minimized to the, the maximum possible. Yeah. So instead of taking any medicine to sleep, if you are able to any of these techniques, whether you know the progressive the relaxation technique that you have or whatever technique that works for you, uh, then if you are able to do it and get a good sleep on the flight, and then that reduces your that's the biggest tool that you have against jet lag. 
and then that should uh, you know minimize it or mitigate it to the maximum extent possible. So whenever I have had international uh, flights, I slept well. I've been fine. But whenever I have not slept during international flight, it's been real horror for me. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you my 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 uh, yeah please uh, yeah. Fear of sleeping on a flight. I'm very afraid that I might end up losing a connection or something like that. So I I typically stay awake during the flight or try to minimize my sleeping so that I'm fully awake. But one of the things that I found recently that helps me sleep is um, this product called Raymeltion, which is the only FDA approved uh, melatonin receptor agonist. Um, that's available on the market. Um, it comes in only one strength, eight milligrams, and it's been phenomenally useful for me. Um, I, I used to try the over-the-counter melatonin and discovered that you know there was no batch-to-batch consistency. Forget forget about batch-to-batch. There was no tablet-to-tablet consistency in terms of how it would work. But with Remelteon, um, it's been a wonderful experience, um, and it has definitely. Improve my uh, sleep. Yeah, as a general rule, I mean, pharmacological interventions are okay pressure. when you do it once in a way. So, on a flight, in you know, an international flight, you're probably going to do it once in three, four months. So, that's perfectly okay. And if somebody is depending on a pharmacological intervention for the daily sleep, that's a bad idea. However, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Is, yeah. No, no, I'm just telling you, absolutely. just for the audience. Yeah. yeah. So, that's perfectly okay. No, no, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything that's done once in a way has got no consequence, health consequence. But when something's done on a daily basis, that's what you mean by lifestyle. And that may have serious consequences. Mr. Devanesan, can you? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. If you can have, turn your camera on, uh, Idil. Uh, I've got a face back on, ma'am. You really don't <laughs> want to see my face. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you so it, much, Dr. Is it a device? It's just your relaxing. Relaxing. <laughs> Thank you so much for the talk, Dr. Bose. I uh, consistently felt like an outsider, uh, feeling like I was this odd person out who had a, a holistic uh, bent, but wasn't a practicing allopath. So thank you so much for, uh, uh, for, for making, it okay, uh, uh, making it okay for me to talk about this to my patients. So I want to really appreciate you for this talk. Um, and the second one I would like to probably suggest is, um, do we, is it possible for us doctors to get together, maybe have a meditation room, a decompressed room, or uh, a, probably a group where people can get together and have like a support group for doctors? Um, because I constantly feel that we are taking the second place to our own professions. And um um, for the first time, I feel completely comfortable saying I'm a practicing meditationer. I'm a practicing pranayama uh, a student. I do yoga every day. Um, I just never, ever, ever said that to any of my patients. So I almost feel like this is my coming out day. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for that. But um, I would love for uh, doctors to get together. If that is possible, is that something that we could consider? That would be my question. Yes. Yeah, I think it's certainly possible. And I said, I think we must reorient ourselves to, you know, look at health intervention because we never taught in medical school. And unless we get together in a group in our hospital, and then not only, you know, if you have a sportsman, for example, you know, have you ever found an international level sportsman who is, uh, uh, is poor in health? Or, you know, have you found, uh, you know, a musician who is not good in music? But, uh, you know, as doctors, our health is very poor. That's a big Paradox that I found always very interesting. And doctors have all kinds of medical problems. They have heart disease, they have liver disease, they have diabetes, they are obese. But we trade in health. That's a profession. It's such a paradox, really, isn't it? So I think we should all get together and we must uh, change this allopathic view into a more holistic view. Then we must uh, distinguish between health intervention and, and disease intervention. And you know, even health group, as you suggested, I think we should all get together. And take this forward. I think that's the way forward, really. But uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> totally, totally agree with that. Uh, Professor Rajaram, would you like to say something else? Vijay, uh, Prima Fasi is an excellent talk that you have given us. But only I feel sorry that you know it should go to the larger audience. 
and special to the community. I just would like to give my own uh, personal experience. Right from my primary school till the college day, till the medical college, I was in taking part in either NCC, scouts, cups, where all these activities were enforced. And today, unfortunately, all these programs have disappeared, including NSS, which is supposed to have been introduced. So I think just now our previous speaker, Edel, has very nicely said that it should be reintroduced or it should be introduced at least in medical fraternity. But is it possible from our side, Vidya can take up the issue with the education board again, because now since the, especially in India, Modi has changed all the ministers, we should recommend that saying that a compulsory half an hour, or one hour, these programs should be reintroduced as yoga has been introduced in many, many, many schools in the US and other ways. I think this is very important. Otherwise, our listening and all these things of, of no, not we may, we may practice, we may give up our melody or whatever it is. But I am interested in percolating this message, percolating into the community, and that can start with the schools and colleges. Absolutely agree with you, sir. Absolutely, we need to do that. Uh, Dr. Vijay, you have already been talking at other forums as well, right? Yes. It sort of, it sort of become my ikigai. And, <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Vijay, your ikigai is, con uh, you know, is uh, connecting this marvelous medicine. I guess it's a great job, and that's my ikigai. <laughs> Do I look so happy? And Radha Krishna, some uh, thoughts from you? No, as expected, uh, Vijay has been brilliant. And actually, you know, uh, uh, for me, uh, for the matter, most people, we are little aware of uh, what is good diet, bad diet, what is good exercise, bad exercise. But these things of... Uh, uh, sleep and uh, relaxation and mindfulness. We all know a little bit of everything, but we never understood that these are all have a lot of scientific basis and they, are, you know, they have a huge impact on our day-to-day -day life. We never really uh, chronicle our sleep patterns nor we uh, correlate anything of uh, what's happening during the daytime with our sleep. I think every, every aspect, I think Vijay can come out many, many more uh, such uh, nuances uh, and everything seems to have some relevance. And as he rightly says, the doctors are the worst people when it comes to um, sleeping properly or eating on time, eating well. I think uh, the moment should come from within as Professor Rajaram is so, so agonized in the whole thing. And actually, it's true that, uh, sir, uh, this sort of marvelous medicine is one attempt to bring things to the public and uh, Mm, Vijay has been working hard, and people like uh, Vijay Bose is a fine for us uh, in, in you know, a, a very, very renowned orthopedic surgeon talking about an area which is so passionate about. And I think uh, is a see that even in this talks, uh, a lot of interest in what he speaks, actually. I think people are interested, people want to change. And I think, as Professor Rajaram says, this is the right time to bring this stuff into schools, colleges, and you know, other social media. I think we should work towards that. Wonderful session, Bose. On second, but we don't want uh, this to be the last one, but then we'll wait for the fourth one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, Professor Radharam, uh, we uh, have uh, YouTube links of these recordings and uh, I mean, of these sessions, and we share them widely. And in fact, uh, uh, though uh, marvelous medicine is perceived as a you know gathering of uh, doctors and different rights, but uh, for all these. Uh, common topics we uh, invite, uh, I send the links to lay public also, to friends, family, everything. And uh, there are a lot of non-doctors logged in today. And uh, many of them are following up with Dr. Vijay with uh, questions and doubts and all. So uh, we have made a small beginning, but uh, I uh, take what you said seriously. And uh, I live in a apartment complex uh, in a community. So uh, there are a lot of uh, young parents. So maybe I will... Uh, uh, you know, approach them and find out how to reach out to a larger audience, especially children and young people. There's a question in the chat box saying, where do you get these recordings? There's a YouTube channel called Learning General Surgery. Learning General Surgery, a YouTube channel. You go there, you get all the marvelous medicine recordings, including uh, Vijay Bose's recordings, please. Learning General Surgery is the uh, YouTube channel. Um, uh, Dr. Dr. Krishna, you are going to say something? 
Kimu is there uh, with you if you wants to come in and uh, comment I couldn't find him Where Yeah he is there he is there Yes sir Ah uh, uh, yeah so Kimu you are keeping yourself hidden you have to give an update to Dr Vijay Bose about uh, what's been happening since May Kimu uh, I have been uh, giving an update uh, uh, to Dr. Bose. Uh, I am following all his uh, part one and part two. And uh, for the first time in 20 years, I have reached less than 75 kilos. And I've been recording this uh, less than 75 kilos in uh, three, four weeks. Uh, doing well. Thank you. You have, uh, you have some more to do now. You've got lots of homework to go through the slides and then. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, I, I, one part of uh, my this thing includes some pranayama, but he wants us to breathe that way throughout the 24 hours. I think I have to take a new leaf uh, uh, like that, but I, I hope we have some of it I can, I can do well. One thing I have noticed is uh, I have stopped waking up after doing exercises at one o'clock and uh, fiddle around with my cell phone till 3.30 and then go back to sleep. So now I sleep until 5.30 comfortably. So there are lots of changes. I am very grateful to Dr. Bose. Uh, Professor Rajaram, you are going to say something, sir? Uh, could you unmute yourself, sir? I, I thought we should start with our own families. For example, sleeping till 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock on weekends should be stopped in our families first. <laughs> uh, well, if you have teenagers, it's very hard to implement, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely a good start. <laughs> I have a few pointers to make, ma'am. Can yes, I ask you one question? Please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Can you put so, your camera on? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, sir. So, uh, basically, you know, um, Firstly, sir, sir, the question I would like to ask you. Do you think that the time management and discipline forms a very major, it, it has a major role in decreasing our stress? So do you think from the very childhood, we should actually improvise on, you know, time management strategies? I think that is very essential. Would you want to say something, sir? Yes, sir? yes I think uh, very important. But sometimes you find people caught up in time management so much that that itself stresses them out. You know? so, <laughs> so there's a balance to everything. Uh, but I think, you know, maybe not children, but uh, as you, you know, enter your professional life, I think uh, it's not, uh, you know, you know, as we say, it's not the, the one who wins, not the one who works the most, but the one who works uh, most effectively. So time management, I think, is very, very important. And I think we should learn. Like anything else, you know, practice makes perfect. Time management is a skill. And once I think we should all practice that. Yeah. Another thing that I want to ask that there's a very common notion. Whenever there is stress, you know, we have grown up listening. Men don't cry. Men don't express. So do you think you would want to break that myth and tell people that it's okay to cry, express, talk, listen, men, women, children, anybody alike? Like I have a three and a half year old son, and I okay. and I feel people okay. having him that you know, don't don't cry. So that is really sad. Yeah, I fully agree with you. Yeah, I think there's all uh, you know societal notions we must break. Yeah, and now you know breathe fully, live fully. Uh, all that is very important. And one last thing I would like to say for here because we're talking about stress, so there is this one five three two strategy which I think I would just want to share with the uh, with the people here. So basically, you know, when we get up in the morning, we we get up thinking about all the things we want to do the entire day. It's like so much is going on. Your mind is completely fogged. It's called as a mind mind fogging. So you know, instead of just starting to prioritize, you know, usse saath ki okay, this is what I want to do, etc. I think first begin by thinking about five people you would like to thank for gratitude, you know, which is very essential. So just begin by thanking those five people, which will take you less than a minute for whatever. Then the next is three. Three, three stands for three minutes. So in the whole day, you can just give about three minutes undivided attention, uh, which is has to be 
totally for people who are around you it can be your parents your your children your spouse your people working for you who you really want to kind of you know acknowledge in in a lot of ways so this it has to be 3 minutes unmindful um, uninterrupted uh, mindfulness uh, you know recognition for their effort and then to to stand for 2 seconds so there's a research that says that you know when we see people we make we make assumptions in less than 30 milliseconds actually you know like this person is this way or that way so they say only for 2 seconds if you can not make those assumptions and just say thank you may god bless you may the power be uh, be with you so this 532 this i have been practicing for a few days now and i feel that it immediately shifts the focus and you know it engages you to the more positive part of your part of your hemisphere right? Thanks. Thanks so much for that. Uh, I I have just uh, pasted the uh, link on the chat box uh, for the playlist of all the episodes of Marvelous Medicine. So uh, while the session uh, the session will be on for another minute or two, so if you wish, you could uh, copy that. Otherwise, just remember uh, YouTube channel Learning General Surgery, and uh, uh, you can go there and search for um, uh, the talk PJ Bose's talk. Uh, if any of you have my mine or uh, radha krishna's uh, phone feel, uh, feel free to send a message and i will send you the link as well so um uh, thank you uh, once again dr bose for uh, that excellent lecture and uh, the amount of uh, time and effort you take to get uh, the all your slides ready and have every single detail explained uh, to uh, absolute dummies uh, uh, i really appreciate that and uh, you are helping us uh, bridge the gap between doctors and non doctors because your talk applies to everybody and uh, thank you dr rajaram for uh, joining us from the us and uh, uh, being so passionate about how we should take this message forward so i never thought of it till now but now i will uh, sort of uh, give it uh, more thought and uh, thank you uh, meena and ramya for uh, you know spending your time during uh, dinner time with kids and all thank you so much for joining and for all your inputs and uh, for all those who are logged in uh, we can we will be meeting professor rajaram again next week where he will be moderating a session uh, by his own students so i am sure we will have a very uh, enjoyable session uh, thank you everyone uh, take care and stay safe we will meet you again next thursday at 8 pm for another episode of marvelous medicine Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night.